Now we turn to the war in Ukraine. Over the past two weeks, chaotic scenes of Russian tanks exploding and driving into minefields were recorded by Ukrainian military drones in Donetsk. Some Russian military bloggers have called it a fiasco, and it points to major failures in the Kremlin's military tactics as it gears up for a spring offensive. Our next guest, investor Bill Browder, joins Walter Isaacson to discuss the effectiveness of the NATO allies sanctions on Russia and the pace of its assistance to Ukraine at this critical juncture. Thank you, Chris John and Bill Brado. Welcome back to the show. Great to be here. You were once the largest uh, foreign investor in Russia. And now for the past two decades, you've been one of the strongest uh, enemies, I would say, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, especially trying to put sanctions on him for the things he's done, and now Ukraine. Tell me, in the past year, since this Ukraine war has happened, what you've learned. Well, we were living in a world before where everybody was, uh, for, for literally for 20 years, everybody was trying to appease Putin. He would do the most terrible things. He invaded Georgia. He carpet-bombed Syria. He took Crimea. And nobody wanted to do anything, um, somehow thinking that, if they just like kept their hands away from him, uh, he would somehow behave himself. And what we've learned is that he's a murderous, uh, a, a mass murderer who's invaded a foreign country, escalated the war, killed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And um, we're now in a, in a world where we have to use everything we've got um, to shut this guy down. Wait, wait, when you say everything we've got, are you talking more about economic sanctions, or should we just go in militarily? Well, I don't think any of us want to send our own troops into to Russia, but um, I think that that if you look at the um, at the at the behavior of of the United States and the EU and various other countries militarily, we've given the Ukrainians enough not to lose the war, but but it's it's drip feeding as we um, uh, as we give them this stuff and and they certainly don't have enough yet um, to win the war. The Zelensky is going around begging for for uh, stronger weapons to repel and and uh, get the Russians uh, out of out of Ukraine and and it's a strat it's it's a it's a thought out strategy not to give the Ukrainians what they need. I've heard this stated explicitly from the United States and other countries. Everybody's worried now about <clears throat> provoking Putin escalating when Putin is doing all the escalating. Well, wait, you you say you talk to U.S. and other military officials and people around the world, and they say we can't do that because the escalation could get too bad. Isn't there a little truth in that? Don't we have to worry about this really escalating out of control? Well, so it's, it, it, it escalated out of control on February 24th. Vladimir Putin launched an invasion of a, of a peaceful neighbor. That was the escalation. He's bombing them every day. He's bombing civilians. He's trying to take out electricity infrastructure. He's killing people all over the place. That's the escalation. And so all we're trying to do now is stop this. And the only way to stop it is by defeating him. And, and if you look at it from, from, a, <clears throat> from a U.S. standpoint, um, here you've got a hostile international power um, that is, doesn't have our best interests at heart. We don't have to lose a single American life by supporting the Ukrainians. They're ready to fight for, for, for all of our freedom. We should give them everything they ask for. For the past year, you've been going around the world and Europe talking about more and more sanctions. Tell me, though, what, what sanctions have been effective so far? Well, I think all of them have been to, to a, a greater or lesser extent. So, but you have to think about sanctions two ways. What, what, sanctions can either be a deterrent, which they haven't been because we didn't use them properly beforehand, or they can be a punishment. Here they've been a punishment. And so there's a whole different um, sort of sections of sanctions. The, the, um, the first is that we've frozen uh, $350 billion of Russian central bank reserves. That's like their war chest. Um, that money is no longer available to them. We've also sanctioned about 40 Russian oligarchs, and there's hundreds of billions of dollars of oligarch money frozen around the world, which, which in my opinion, that's sort of uh, another war chest to Putin's. He can draw on that money. Uh, we've also cut Russians, Russia's banks, many of them, most of them, off of the SWIFT international banking system. We've sanctioned the oil companies. We've, we've also uh, made it impossible for them to import uh, technology. 
And this is, I, I think all of these things are, are grinding Russia down. It's, it's not going to be something that happens overnight, but it's grinding Russia down. And when do you think that will grind them down so that they might stop? I'm not sure it's going to grind them down to, to them stopping for one simple reason, because they continue to sell oil and gas in large quantities to the West. Um, the, numbers, the numbers after the war were like a, a billion dollars a day um, of, of Western money was going into Russia um, and a billion dollars a day was being spent uh, to kill Ukrainians. And, and the numbers might not be a billion dollars a day anymore. Maybe it's 700 million a day or 500 million a day, but it's still a lot of money that's going into Russia, which they can use for their war effort. And until we stop buying their oil and finding a way to get other people to stop buy, buying their oil, um, they continue to have money to do this. How could we get people to stop buying oil? I mean, what should we do on oil? Um, we, we could say to all the, so there, there, there is a, a big proportion of the world right now, a very big proportion, the G7, the European Union, um, uh, who have all said, um, we want to sanction Russia, we want to prevent them from doing this. Then there's a, a much smaller section of the world from an economic standpoint that says that we want to continue to do business with Russia countries like South Africa and Indonesia and Brazil and India. And we could easily, if we wanted to, we could say to those countries, if you want to do business with us, you can't do business with Russia. Well, wait a minute. If we had to do that, we'd be saying you can't do business with China. You can't do business with India. You can't do business with South Africa. All of these countries have not yet joined the sanctions regime. I, I, but that's what I'm saying is so, so you go to South Africa, for example, you say, you know, you, you want 70% of the world or you want 1% of the world? Because if you do business with 1% of the world, we're going to cut you off from 70% of the world. We could, we could actually do that. And if we did that, um, they would have to make a choice. Right now, we're, we're not forcing them to make any choice. And we could isolate Russia much further than we're currently doing if, if we said to everybody, you know, <laughs> it's either us or them. And, and everybody always votes with their feet and votes with the money when it comes right down to it. We haven't put that to them. We haven't been tough in that way. That's one thing we could do. There's one other thing which I've been um, going around the world talking about, which I think would make a big difference in the war in Ukraine, which is that after the war started, the first thing the Western governments did was we, we froze $350 billion of central bank reserves. The war has done one, at least a trillion, maybe $1.2 trillion of damage to Ukraine. Russia has done the damage. We have custody of their money. Instead of just having that money frozen, that money should be confiscated and handed over to the Ukrainians, both for their defense and their reconstruction. Putin broke it, he should fix it. Um, that's probably the single biggest thing we could do in the very short term um, to tip the balance in Ukraine's favor in this whole conflict. Explain to me the mechanics of confiscating uh, the central bank reserves. Well, so, so at the moment, those reserves are protected by something called sovereign immunity. <clears throat> sovereign immunity means that anything that belongs to a country, a state, can't be taken away. You can't like just move into the embassy because you would like that property because it belongs to that country. And normally that would be a reasonable thing and th that's how international law has worked for the last you know, many, many years. Now, Putin has redefined international crime. He has redrawn the borders of Europe. He's invaded a foreign country. He's killed. He's been a mass murderer, killed the uh, unimaginable numbers of people. And so we're sitting there in this situation where he's redef redefined international crime. Um, and we're and we're sitting there saying, and your money is still protected. We need to redefine international law to elevate it to the level of his, the way he's become an international criminal. And what does that mean specifically? That means that, that laws have to be passed in a number of major developed countries, which says that sovereign immunity always applies in every single circumstance, except in the circumstance when a country has invaded a neighboring country and, and committed an act of aggression, which is how this war is being defined under legal terms. So that's the one narrow circumstance where sovereign immunity no longer applies. Um, if we did that, if the United States and the European Union and Great Britain and Canada and Japan uh, rewrote their laws to say that sovereign immunity applies in all circumstances other than those, um, then we could then confiscate their money. We wouldn't be doing it illegally. We'd be doing it based on a law that's being rewritten to 
<clears throat> adapt itself to the current situation. If you wanted to confiscate the foreign reserves, and you've talked about laws being passed in the West, would China and India have to go along? Well, so, so the thing is that, that all you have to do is get the countries that have reserve currencies revise their laws. So in other words, um, we don't, you know, if China, if China we don't keep our, our money in China, so it's not a reciprocal thing. If you get the major reserve currencies, the places where, where Russia keeps their money, and by the way, there's one other great um, benefit to doing this, which is that if we confiscate Russia's money for invading uh, a neighboring country, who else has got a whole bunch of money in the West that's eyeing and potentially going to invade a neighboring country? That's China. Now, some people would argue that, that, that this idea is a dangerous idea because where's, where China will just like abandon all countries and keep their money at home. But that just, you know, if it's just the U.S. doing this, that might happen with the dollar. But if everybody does it together that has a reserve currency, Ch then China will have to um, go along with it. They'll, I mean, they have to be uh, scared of it. What about in the Middle East? Both Israel and the Saudis don't seem to be on board. What do you, what, what's the reason for that and what can be done? Well, I, I think it's, um, uh, it's really shameful that the Israelis, um, who are, is a, Israel's a country that, that was formed as a sort of reaction uh, to a genocide, are now seeing a genocide taking place in another country and are not helping out that country. I find that really unpleasant and, and disturbing. Wait, well, why is that, do you think? Well, their argument is that um, the Russians are in Syria. Syria uh, poses an existential threat to Israel, and therefore they've got to play all different sides. Um, uh, I think they could easily, for, for example, the Israelis have an Iron Dome defense uh, situation which prevents people from bombing them. Um, they should provide that Iron Dome uh, defense mechanism uh, to Ukraine so that they're not the Ukrainian infrastructure isn't destroyed. They could easily help the Ukrainians with defensive uh, weapons. And on the Saudi Arabian side, um, uh, that they've really not been a good ally to the United States. That they're, they're historically, the United States um, had a deal, which is that the Saudis keep oil prices stable to keep the economy stable, and in return, the United States provides a sort of military blanket over Saudi Arabia so that they're protected. And the military blanket continues to exist, but they haven't been playing ball when it comes to oil. When the oil prices went up because of Putin, uh, what do they do? They cut production even more. I think the Saudis aren't playing uh, fair game, and nor is the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates are hosting scores of Russian oligarchs. Numerous Russian oligarch yachts are parked in Dubai. Um, you know, this is another country that's supposed to be an ally of the United States, and and they're not playing ball. And so th there's a lot of um, a lot of pressure that we could apply to to our allies if we chose to do it. And and uh, the United States is a very powerful country, and and uh, and I believe should in, in in all three cases. One of the things you've always pushed for is going after Putin's wealth personally. Tell me, how did he get all that money, and where is it, and what can we do? Well, so Putin doesn't keep any money in his own name. If he did, then then whoever had the bank documents to show it could blackmail him. So Putin has to rely on people he trusts. I call them oligarch trustees. And so when you see an oligarch who's supposedly worth 15 or 20 billion dollars on paper, um, you can be pretty well sure that half that money belongs to Vladimir Putin. And so when we sanction the oligarchs, when we identify the, the biggest and richest oligarchs in Russia and we freeze their money, we're not just freezing their money, we're freezing Vladimir Putin's money. And so one of the reasons that I've been so um, forceful on the issue of sanctioning Russian oligarchs is because we're sanctioning Vladimir Putin personally. And so that, that we, we've done a good job with that. And, and, and you know, he says, oh, this doesn't matter. Well, he's, he's fuming um, when these oligarchs find their assets frozen at different banks around the world. You say this is going to be a long war the way it's going now. Uh, envision for me what it'll be like five years from now if this thing is still going on the way it is. Well, this is Putin's, Putin, his, his vision, in my mind, is he knows he can't win the war, um, but he also doesn't care about the uh, lives lost from his side. Um, he doesn't really care about the, um, the, the, the destruction of his, of, of his military equipment. 
in in this in his mind, what he's thinking is that we're going to lose patience before he loses patience. He's thinking that in these democratic countries where we have elections all the time, where um, we grow tired and uh, where, where, where we have a limited bandwidth, that eventually um, we're going to stop supporting Ukraine. And that, that's his only way out of this whole thing is just to outlast us. And so... Well, wait, wait, might he be right? Um, that I think that that's my biggest fear. I mean, if you look at the trajectory of the Ukrainians right now, they're really causing just no end of, of hardship for Putin and his military. Um, and on the current trajectory, he, the, the Ukrainians probably would eventually succeed over some long period of time. And so, but, but the, the, we, uh, we've, we've heard murmurings um, in the United States and in Europe from far right, from all sorts of strange characters saying no more money for Ukraine, no more support for Ukraine. If those murmurings um, that are at the moment very narrow sections of, of the political establishment become bigger sections, um, Putin may very well be right. And that's, that's the fear I have. And the reason why it's so important that we actually finally pony up whatever we have to do to help the Ukrainians win in a shorter period of time. Is it possible that there could be negotiations or is that something you just can't envision? Well, I, I've been in a, in a conflict with Putin, a personal uh, battle with Putin for more than a decade over the murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. And um, I've seen, and the battle has escalated to the point where there's international sanctions named after Magnitsky applied to Russia, which has led to all sorts of retaliation by the Russian government. And every time the Russians have an opportunity to do the right thing, to negotiate, to back down, to be reasonable, Instead of doing the right thing, they've doubled down, tripled down, and escalated. I've never seen a moment when Putin shows any sign of compromise, any negotiation, any reasonableness in anything I've ever dealt with and anything else. He doesn't have the capacity to do that. And so here we are um, with this war in Ukraine, and he can't, he can't afford to show one tiny sign of, of negotiation of compromise. And I, so from, from that perspective, and we've seen it. We've seen it play out. He doesn't. In, in he says, "I'm ready to for a peace negotiation." And that negotiation, the preconditions are Ukraine gives up their territory, and um, and that's it. And of course, the Ukrainians aren't going to give up their territory. He invaded. He should be rewarded with their territory. No way. Bill Browder, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.